right, well, hello, friends, old and new. Nice to see so many faces. Thank you for coming out tonight on what actually turned out to be a sunny Thursday night. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Julie Volchek Burke. I direct fundraising at JCHS. Don't worry, there will be no solicitations made this evening. Um, it was funny in response to the promotion for tonight's event, it was the first time in an entire year that we heard reasons like people were traveling so they couldn't make it and people were going to their kids' volleyball games so they couldn't make it. So I think, uh, I think times they are a change in, which is actually part of tonight's theme. And um, just to give you a little background, when we started this online series a year ago, it was because we were really freaked out about how we're gonna accomplish all of the togetherness and wonderful community that we're all used to at JCHS every year. And it's turned out this program, Belonging Together, has turned out to be um, really special because it's given everyone a glimpse into the classroom from the comfort of their living rooms. Um, to see how wonderful our, fac our faculty is. And um, you know, it's an opportunity to smile knowingly at folks in the gallery that you haven't seen in a while. So thanks for coming tonight and for the past year. It's, it's been really lovely. Um, tonight, I'm really thrilled to introduce a, a power duo at JCHS and two really good friends. Evan Wolkenstein directs uh, experiential education at JCHS and he teaches Jewish studies. And he happens to be a published author of young adult books in his spare time. And Jen Sturgill is chair of our visual and performing arts department at JCHS. And she's also an accomplished artist. Um, in normal times, you would most likely see these two jogging together after school. Uh, but tonight, uh, they're on your Zoom screen. So uh, Evan and Jen, thank you and take it away. Great. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Thank you. Um, hi, Gretchen. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm very happy to see you. I'm happy to see all of you. Um, I wanna take a moment before we start talking about um, stuff tonight that's gonna to be uh, interesting and introspective and um, we're gonna go all over the place emotionally, but there was, I, I was just informed, I was sent along a, um, uh, a headline from Howard Rubin, head of school about a uh, an accident that happened in Israel. Uh, right now they're celebrating uh, Lag Bomer or coming close to celebrating Lag Bomer, um, which is a holiday which involves a, a pilgrimage. It's one of the few uh, in certain traditions of, of, of Judaism. Uh, and there's a pilgrimage to a place called Mount Moron, which I've been to on Lag Bomer. And it's traditionally celebrated with uh, bonfires and it's kind of a mystical holiday. And apparently there was um, a crush or a stampede and something like 30 something people lost their lives. That's my understanding. Um, I have not read any full articles. I just saw that headline. So it didn't seem uh, right to just start our program without mentioning it. I don't know the details. I could be corrected on any number of the things that I just said, but just on the, um, but understanding that something bad has happened in Israel on Mount Moron, that there was some kind of a crush. Um, I just wanted to kind of hold that space um, and to, in, in whatever way, the, the merit of this learning together, <laughs> the, good, the good karma of this learning together, whether it be um, to, uh, to guide the hands of doctors who are helping, whether it's um, just, uh, to comfort the families, um, the souls of those who lost their lives. You know, I don't know. There's not much to say um, in response to that other than for whatever we can't, whatever good things come out of this learning um, might be in the name of, of that. So I just wanted to take a moment to, to hold that space. Um, so now we're gonna transition from talking about one of the first, lar I think the largest gathering in Israel since COVID started to the topic of tonight's um, of tonight's activity together, which is called the chrysalis in the prison. Uh, this being a, a time of uh, some kind of being locked into something. And we're gonna talk about the ups and the downs of that. So to get us started, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, four quotes. And I'm also gonna give you a link in case the screen share is like, in case the um, resolution is not good. So here's the doc, but I'm also gonna screen share it. 
And what I'd like to invite you to do is to uh, either reflect silently or in the in the chat, either one. The prompt is, uh, and I'll put the prompt in the chat as well, in case you're the reading type. The prompt is, which of these quotes do you most relate to or react against? And feel free to like put the number and why, or just the number, or just kind of like hold it. What, which one of these do you react, uh, either, either relate to or react against? And here we go. I'm just going to show this. And if it's too fuzzy, uh, feel free to just look at the link that I shared. Give me a thumbs up if you can see four quotes. Good. Okay. Can you read them? Are you able to read them? Great. They're too small. Could you, would you mind? I'd be happy to read it. Sure. Also, the link in the chat will bring you to there. So the one in the upper left is Nikola Tesla. Um, who's one of the pioneers of uh, discovering or experimenting with electricity. The mind is sharper and keener in seclusion and uninterrupted solitude. Originality thrives in seclusion, free of outside influences beating upon us to cripple the creative mind. Be alone. That is the secret of innovation. Be alone. That is when ideas are born. I'm going to go down now to Desmond Tutu. Uh, a leading figure in, uh, in uh, human rights and uh, pushing aside apartheid. A person is a person through other persons. You can't be human in isolation. You are human only in relationships. The next one, the one in the upper right is from somebody that I wasn't familiar with and their biography uh, was, surprised me. And I was a little bit like, I don't know about this person. Um, but uh, talking with Jen about it, we sort of agreed that, you know, that sometimes wisdom comes from even places that you might not have thought. So we'll let that one roll. But the quote is, loneliness is not lack of company. Loneliness is lack of purpose. Let that resonate. So that's numbered. Uh, they're numbered here. So we got one, two, three, and four. And the last one is Bell Hooks, uh, feminist and... Uh, uh, community leader, uh, especially in the civil rights movement and after, knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others without using them as a means of escape. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, and feel free to either just reflect or drop in the chat, which one of these speaks to you or do you react against? Let's take a moment. So can we just talk or, or not necessarily? No, no, I think for now, just we're gonna let this be a kind of resonant okay. moment. Yeah, because right. there's gonna be there's gonna be time where we're gonna uh, go a little okay. deeper. Thank you. Yeah, just kind of setting the stage. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share and we're gonna move forward uh, you know, we learn from these quotes that solitude can be a lonely kind of prison and also a transformative chrysalis, depending on the goal and the possibilities and, and purpose and relationships, and even on how much experience and practice you have at it. And that many of us have known both of these in our lives. So I'd love to now uh, take a time to unpack for ourselves, moving from this idea of isolation and solitude and thinking about this year that we're coming out of the year that was um, as a chrysalis and or a prison so we're going to do a little bit of it's like a kind of a step back step step forward step back uh, type activity but we're not going to do anything fancy with screens I'm going to describe a situation and if you relate to that like at some point during the last year that was you you can do sparkles or you can wave and I think we'll be able to see on our screen if people are, are resonating. Okay, everybody ready? If you're excited to be here tonight, sparkles. Okay, great. Spark. Wave your hands if you found yourself sometime this year spiraling over a very critical world concern. Could be the election, spread of the disease, Black Lives Matter, at some point, spiraling Spark. over world concern. Now, Sparkle, if you found yourself spiraling over what pair of socks to order online or some similar conundrum. <laughs> what type of paper towels to get? 
Uh, Sparkle, if you took on a new hobby or passion and it had at least a tiny modicum of success. Now, Sparkle, if you discovered new levels of misery when that new hobby or passion didn't work out. <laughs> okay. Wave, Sparkle, if you made a deeper connection to someone, even via Zoom. Deeper connection to someone. Now, Sparkle, if you watched a relationship sputter or stall despite Zoom or because of Zoom, <laughs> sputter or stall. Sparkle. Okay, got some people. Sparkle, if you asked yourself some difficult, inconvenient questions about who you are and what's important to you. Difficult, inconvenient questions about who you are and what's important. Sparkle. Now, Sparkle, if you at least once frittered away an entire afternoon or several days because, you know, what's the point anyhow? <laughs> okay. Sparkle, if you discovered that stripped of your professional outfits, your daily commute, your daily physical routine, and no crowds to distract you, you basically like who you are. Sparkle. Yeah, basically like you are at some point. Now, Sparkle, if you discovered that stripped of your professional outfits, your daily commute, your daily physical routine, and no crowds to distract you, you've discovered some warts, bumps, things you're not crazy about who you are. Sparkle. Many of us. Sparkle, if for many of us this year of, oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it. So for many of us, just I'm observing here, <laughs> um, this year of solitude and isolation has been actually tragic. That, that is the case for, for many of us, that is the case. And if that's you, if you experience some tragedy this year, then we wanna hold that and we wanna see that. And, and also for many of us, it's also been this kind of awful opportunity. Like, is it awful? Is it an opportunity? It's, it's sometimes it's a little hard to tell. Uh, even if we didn't ask for it or want it, there were certain things about it that we may have been, uh, opportunities that we had that we, might have been surprised by. So as it turns out, Jewish civilization has a lot to say about solitude and isolation as both awful and an opportunity. Uh, the Bible is so concerned with isolation that the first book, Genesis, is almost exclusively about lonely people doing lonely things. Adam and Eve alone in the garden. You could even say God alone in the cosmos before that one sibling killing another with no one to prevent it or address it, Noah and his family alone on an ark, Abraham and Sarah leaving their homeland on a mission that they can't possibly understand. And if that's not enough, we have every patriarch going on some lonely journey. We have Joseph alone in a well and then a prison. And then Exodus, we have the Israelites enslaved and see, sensing that no one can see their misery for generations. So I think it's safe to say our tradition has very strong feelings about the potential and the damage that can be caused by isolation. So now we're gonna turn now to a later Bible story. This is our text for tonight, which is very much about isolation and it can give us some language and imagery uh, for our own complicated year. Now, what's gonna happen now is I'm gonna invite you to open and follow along with me, if you like, uh, the text if you printed it out. And if you didn't print it out, I'll toss back in the, um, in the chat a link to the text so that you can follow along. Here is the text. And if you scroll down to version one, I'll even kind of highlight it so you can see it. Is that working? Give me a thumbs up if you either have it in paper or you're able to find version one. Okay, great. Now, I'm going to acknowledge that the way we're doing this is, is unusual for my style um, and for a uh, an event where we're doing Torah together. Generally, uh, we would read a little, we would discuss a little, we would unpack a little, but I'm going to do it a little differently tonight. I'm going to read you excerpts from the story of Elijah, and I'm going to explain who he is that's heavily redacted. I've only selected shamelessly texts that give you a certain kind of an experience because that's gonna lead us to our 
theme and our poem for tonight. There's gonna to be a lot of freedom about what to do with the text, but I acknowledge I am in fact reading it a very particular sort of way. I even took some minor liberties with translation to cut the cake in a certain direction. So I just want you to know if, if we're going through this and you're like, wait a minute, that's not, the, that's not how I read it. Totally understandable. I'm intentionally giving us a certain kind of experience of this story. Okay, everybody on board? And now we're gonna start the tour of the Elijah story. Here's what you need to know. Elijah the prophet, that's his full name, Eliyahu Hanavi, that's what we call him in Jewish civilization. This is the same Eliyahu, the same Elijah that we invite to seders, we invite him to circumcisions, he's supposed to herald the Messiah. He's like kind of like a folk hero, but he's actually kind of a complicated guy. And by complicated, I mean that kind of in a uh, euphemistic sense. He's got some warts and some bumps. So in this story, all of God's prophets at this point have been executed. There are no prophets left by this corrupt Israelite king and queen. Elijah is the last surviving prophet all alone. He's like the last Jedi. And Israel is still suffering from an epidemic of idolatry, which God very much dislikes. But you know who seems to dislike it even more than God? Elijah. Elijah really does not like this epidemic of idolatry, and this is how he responds. This is excerpt one. Elijah says to King Ahav, as the Lord lives, the God of Israel who I serve, there will be no dew or rain except at my bidding. So the word of God came to him, leave this place, turn eastward and go into hiding by the wadi, that's a riverbed, Harit. You're going to drink from the wadi, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. The ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening, and he drank from the wadi. So here's some notes, just to clarify. We have a drought but, uh, that Elijah called into happening, but he's being saved in an isolated place, and he's being fed by a raven. He's the one who caused the drought. Uh, even if like God cashes the check that Elijah wrote, Elijah initiated it. The raven which appears in the story of Noah, if you're familiar with that story, the raven is known for eating carrion and feeding itself and not coming back to the ark when it's set free. It's only concerned with its own hunger and it's plenty of dead things to find and the raven and so it never comes back to the ark. And now Elijah is being fed by a raven. And might, one might wonder why is God, and we're not gonna answer it, just let it resonate. Why would God secret Elijah away in this wadi? Is it to protect him? Is it to save him or is it to teach him something? Okay, just let that resonate for a moment. Okay, what's God's plan putting him in this wadi? Now, here's excerpt two. After some time, the wadi dried up because why? There was no rain in the land. Why? <laughs> Elijah called a drought. And the word of God came to him and said, get up and go to Tzrafat of Sidon and stay there. I've appointed a widow there to feed you. You might wonder, why is she a widow? What happened to her husband? Well, there is a drought going on, so we might wonder the worst. The widow is going to feed you, says God. And so he goes to the entrance of the town, and the widow's there gathering wood. And Elijah calls out to her, and he says, please bring me a little water in your pitcher and let me drink. And then I jump forward a little. She goes to fetch it, and he calls out, could you bring along a piece of bread for me? Okay. So next in the story... Elijah creates this miracle that feeds the starving woman and her child. By the way, sidebar, one of the ways he saves her is he, she finds a jar of oil that pours oil nonstop. And if you're wondering where the rabbis get the Hanukkah miracle from, it's actually borrowed from this. They were riffing on this story. So Elijah creates this miracle. The starving woman is saved from starvation. He heals the child but he does not end the drought and he doesn't stay with the woman, okay? The drought does not end. So she is fine, I guess. Um, the drought goes on. So why has God brought Elijah to the suffering family? To feed him? To feed her? To teach him something? Again, just let that resonate. Next, Elijah is forced to duel the prophets of idolatry. They're gonna do a contest. Who can cause it to rain? So there's idolatrous prophets that are kind of like uh, run by the king and queen and they fail, they humiliate themselves. Of course, the idolatrous prophets can't cause rain. Elijah, he does like one easy miracle and the, the rain comes back right away. So the drought is over, 
but now he's a target for the angry king and queen. So frightened, he flees, he runs away uh, for his life. And he came to Beersheba and he left his servant there. So now he's alone and he goes a day's journey where into the wilderness and he comes to a broom bush and he sits down under it. If this was resonant of Jonah to you, you're on the right track, but that's for another conversation. And he prays that he might die. Enough, he cried, oh Lord, take my life for I am no good. The, the Hebrew is I'm no better than my fathers or my ancestors, you could include that too. I'm no good or I'm no better than my ancestors or my mentors even. He lay down and fell asleep under a broom bush. So just to note here that he won the battle against idolatry, uh, or sorry, he won the battle of that um, duel, but he is a kind of losing the war against idolatry. He's running for his life. He perceives he's in danger. This can't be a great day for Elijah. So excerpt four, an angel touches him and says, get up and eat. Okay, there's that eating again, right? A lot of eating in the story. He looks about and there beside his head, there's a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. He eats and drinks and he lays down. And then the angel comes a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat. Does that sound like deja vu? Same exact words. It's like an echo almost. Rise and eat or the journey will be too much for you. Journey? Which way should he be journeying? That's interesting. We don't know. But he gets up and he eats and drinks. And with the strength from the meal, oh, he just walks 40 days and 40 nights as far as the mountain of God at Horeb, sometimes called Mount Sinai. So he eats this meal and he's like, okay, here we go. And just walks to Mount Sinai. So we have a lot of deja vu, Elijah sleeping, an angel waking him up and telling him to eat. And this feeding imagery has been with us since the beginning, the raven, the widow. We don't know if Elijah is going the right direction for 40 days, or maybe he, is he running towards his goal, or is he running away from his goal, the wrong direction? And now, my friends, the climax of the story. I love this scene. Ah, love it. Okay, excerpt five. He go, he's already alone in the desert, and now he goes into a cave, and he spends the night. Now it's dark. The word of the Lord came to him. He said to him, why are you here, Elijah? And he replied, I'm moved by passion for the Lord, the God of hosts. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to the sword. I'm the last one left, and they're out to take my life. Come out. God called, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And wow, the Lord passed by. There was a great and mighty wind. If you know the movie, A Mighty Wind, that's where the title's from. A great and mighty wind, splitting mountains, shattering rocks by the power of the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, silent sound. In Hebrew, it's kol damama daka. Dak is like minute or like wispy, whispery. It's like a wisp of a wisp. When Elijah heard that, he wrapped his cloak around his face and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Now, ready to get weird. Then God's, sorry, then a voice addressed him. Why are you here, Elijah? He answered, I am moved by zeal for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and have put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left, and they are out to take my life. Now that should sound super familiar, because that's the same speech he just gave to the same question. So what happens next? Uh, Elijah basically loses his job. This is the end of Elijah. After this, he goes off to appoint his successor, Elisha, and you know the song, Swing Low Sweet Chariot? He calls down, a basically a chariot of fire comes down, also chariots of fire, lots of movie references tonight. Chariot of fire comes down and takes Elijah away. Either he's just been promoted or he's been fired, no pun intended, in a super cool way, one of the two. So in one way or another, he's done with his job. So the summary is God asks the same question twice. Elijah gives the same answer twice. It gives you the feeling that Elijah is or has been missing some very important message God has been hammering since the drought began. 
or I'm going to credit Jen with this one, is that second conversation where a voice spoke to him. Is that God or is that an echo of his own inner voice asking the same question and his own inner resistance to movement? Echo again and again, the same question. Why are you here? I'm here because blah, 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 blah. Why are you here? So it's some thoughts to ponder. Elijah caused the drought that caused the story to happen. He rides and hunt, uh, hides and runs over and over. To what extent do we create our own solitude and our own connection? He goes through cycles of hunger and tiredness and is repeatedly fed and awoken. To what extent does repetition allow us to learn and grow? Or does repetition, repetition lead to stagnation? Think about your own repetitions of this year. Learning and growing or stagnation? Elijah spends the whole story alone, but also butting heads against a king and a queen, a widow, God, the nation of Israel who won't listen to him, and even himself. So who and what brought struggle and tension to, to this year for you? And was there meaning or purpose to be discovered in, that, in those struggles, that tension? Next, Elijah does not manage to affect any real change on the world, or so it seems anyway. To what extent do we feel like this year has or has not mattered in any grand scheme? And how do we make peace with that? And then the big Uber question, have we made peace? Have I made peace? Have you made peace with who we are when we're alone? Okay, so you've been very patient. This concludes our framing and our text tour and it brings us to our activity, which is gonna be an art form known as blackout poetry. So I'd love to hand it over now to Jen to tell us what that activity is gonna look, look like. Thank you, Evan. That was a, loved going on that tour with you. And that incredible passage from the Bible is so full of imagery and open-ended questions. And so I feel like this particular kind of um, art form, blackout poetry is an ideal form um, to, to parallel, to parallel what we just, uh, where we just were with you. So um, blackout poetry, you may have heard it. it's a pretty popular art form. You probably have heard of it before, but if you haven't, it's a form of appropriation art in which you take text, you work with text that is not written by you. It could be a magazine page, some, just something from the newspaper, it could be um, a page of your favorite book, but in this case, the Bible. Um, and you work with the text to select and find particular words of the text that will then in the end form a poem. Um, and so <clears throat> you have no control over the words that you begin with, but by choosing and selecting the words and gathering, um, you will discover just through the process of reading words that resonate with you for some reason and just trust your intuition on this. Um, and when you're done with the reading the text and selecting and circling the words that have resonated with you, that is a time when you quote unquote black out everything else. And the blacking out can be quite literal in which you have a black marker and just like on a CIA, CIA document that's been redacted, um, you literally black out everything else. It can also take a more artful uh, process and, and approach to it as well in which you, instead of blacking out, you create a decorative pattern um, or even imagery. Um, in this case, perhaps some imagery that struck you from the passage. Um, and that's something that you could draw in the non-selected words. And yet a third way is to create some kind of visual path that links the words together so that you can read the poem in sequence. So once you selected the words and it becomes the poem, um, the bank of the vocabulary comes from the text you're handed and through your own intuition, you can find new meanings in the text. Um, you might also discover something about how you think or feel at the moment, especially after going through some of the, the tour and the questions that were brought up. Um, but hopefully something sparkles up 
from the words that you've selected. Um, a new way of putting things, which you might not have discovered if you just started with a blank page to write a poem. Um, so in the art form, you create a visual reframing of a text through the process of selection. So there's two approaches. One is just to dive in, just go right into the text with a, I, I suggest with a pencil um, and start circling words, just reading through the text, circling the words that jump out at you. That's one approach. The other approach is to do a little bit of planning. Um, and so some thinking before you actually start to, to circle some of the words in the text, um, what's on your mind, or maybe there's some themes that struck you in the tour that Evan led and you were thinking about maybe trying to find and working with. So um, in that case, we provided some prompts for you to um, use so that you, if you want to choose the approach where you're doing a little bit of pre-thinking, um, there's some prompts there for you to use. Um, so the poem which emerges from the selection process may be completely abstract. I want to emphasize that, that this is very loose. It's very individual, very open-ended. There's no obligation for you to construct a narrative or somehow to sort of summarize sort of the deeper meanings. This, the words that you choose really should just be ones that you choose from an intuitive place. So in that case, it might look abstract in the end. Um, but you can also choose words that will form sentences as, and you'll sort of discover that as you're reading that you might want to choose words that like the and a and of so that you have clusters of phrases that will link together in a poem. Um, so here's the process. Get the sheets of paper out if you've printed them. Um, but if you want to work digitally, um, Evan has provided the link for that. And I think you're gonna put that in the chat. Yes, Evan? Yep, there it comes. So, so there is a, a process in which you can do this exact form of art, um, but in a digital way rather than analog, but we have examples of both here. So you're gonna decide two things. First, do you wanna begin by roaming around the text and just selecting words, getting just diving right in? Or would you like to work from a prompt? So we've included those prompts here. If you'd like to start circling words, go for it. And when you're happy with the words you've selected, when, by the time you get to the end of the text, um, that's great. You can absolutely start to begin to black out. And I'm using air quotes for that because you certainly can literally black it out, but you can also think about how you might want to push back the non-selected words, you know, under a decorative pattern or an image um, or some kind of path. Um, if you are doing it digitally, you might bold or underline instead of circling. And instead of blacking out with markers, you could highlight the words you did not choose or even delete them. Evan. Great, uh, I have some, uh... Give me a thumbs up if you can see this little blacked out poem there. Are you able to see that? Yeah, you can see it, good. So here's a digital uh, version of it. And here's some pictures of uh, Jen's um, blackout poetry. She, here's where the words are circled. Here's a version where she's taken the text, circled it, and then connected it. Um, a astute participant uh, noticed that there are two versions uh, of the text, and that is because one of them I converted every reference to he, I turned it into I, and every reference to himself to myself, because so I thought that might help you connect to the text a little. Um, and then the last thing is, um, if you're ready to go, you can get started uh, in about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, wherever you get to is great if you blacked out Great. If you just circled words, great. If you went down the rabbit hole, just reflecting on the prompts, that's great. So with that, we'll start the timer. It'll be about 10, we'll, 10 minutes, we'll check in. We can extend to 15 if we want. Um, and we'll start the music and enjoy your, your process. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, 
feel free to ask in the chat. One person said they can't uh, highlight or underline. That's because you have to make your own copy. The, the version that you link to is mine. So if you make a copy of it, then you'll be able to do that. And I'll continue monitoring the chat uh, in case people run into trouble.
Hmm. Hi, everyone. It's like that moment when you finish the last pose in a yoga class. Oops, when the alarm goes off. Last pose in a yoga class or like a meditation sit where everybody stretches and yawns. Okay. Jen, you want to lead us in the next phase? You are on mute. I would love to get some more. Am, okay. Am yep. I, can you hear me now? Thumbs up if you can hear me now. Okay, great. Um, I just love to gather some reactions. Uh, and I wanted to, maybe what we could do in the tradition of a WOLT class is take a, uh, do a speaker's list. Uh, so, and so what I'm hoping that, um, we could do is, is share each, with each other just either reading the poem that you wrote, an excerpt from it, or just any reflection that you have. And so when you do a speaker's list, it's just totally voluntary. You're not obligated to speak, but if you have something you'd like to, to share, then raise your hand and I will call on your name. Well, I'll give you a number. That's what the list does. We do a one and we do a two, we do a three. <laughs> Do we have a one? <laughs> I, I'll do it, Rebecca. Will do it. Thank you, Rebecca. Great. Do we have a two? Thank you. Yes. I remind me of your name. Your name's not on the screen. Jackie. There you are, Jackie. Okay, great. So we have Rebecca one, Jackie two. Do we have a three? I think I saw Judy trying to raise her hand. How about Judy Stein, number three? Absolutely, Judy. Thank you. Three. Maybe we could get like four to six people. So do we have a four? Yes, Deb. Great. Uh, and, and how about Anastasia have... slash Nadia after Deb? Definitely. Definitely. All right, that, great. That's five. How about if we have one more? One more. Do we have a six? Okay, well, let's get started with that. Five then. is great. And if someone Five after great. That wants to join. So remember your number, and I'm just going to the processes that I'll just call on um, by the number. And so one. Thank you. All right, I'll just read my poem. I live, go, arise. Oh, oh sorry, I left out one word. <laughs> All right. I live, go, arise. Stay, arise, stand. That's the whole thing. That, that's the whole thing. I kept, those are the words that came in. I feel like they absolutely 100% are a serum of truth. So thank you. Thank you. Two. Okay, I think I will share my poem, but I'll also answer the prompt a little bit about the process because I, I just wanted to share, that was a very interesting exercise. 
originally, I think I was very wrapped up in the Elijah story and I was kind of thinking about how that played into what I was gonna pick. And then I started thinking it became more what I wanted to say. And then I was looking for words to make what I wanted to say what was coming out. So that was just kind of a surprise for me. That's not how the process started, but that's how it evolved. Uh, and this is what I circled. The Lord lives, the God of Israel will feed you. Life, good, angel touched him. Journey and strength from the Lord, word of the Lord. The Lord was in the still silent sound. I am not alone. Mm. Thank you, Jackie. Three. I guess that's me. I think that's you, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, this goes, I found this pretty grim, actually. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'll read what I said and uh, what I circled, and then I'll, uh, I have a couple of comments. Um, I said there will be no dew or rain. Leave this place, go into hiding, and stay there. Arise, go. Please, let me drink. Frightened, I fled, alone. Prayed that I might die. Enough, I cried. I ate, drank, and lay down again. The journey will be too much for you. Why are you here? I am moved by passion. I alone am left. Come out and stand. Why are you here? I am moved forsaken, torn down. I alone am left, and they are out to take my life. That, uh, that's my year, I think. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, not all the time, but it's, it's a pretty good um, uh, picture of the frustration, I think, and the, uh, the isolation. So this was very interesting. Um, I, I thought it was a really good thing to do, a very interesting thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. Um, do we have four? Hi. So mine is similar to Judy's, Judy, what Judy did. Um, this has been a great exercise. I agree. It's, it's nice. Um, so here we go. There will be no dew or rain. Leave. Go into hiding. You will drink and I commanded to feed you there. Brought me bread and meat every morning and every evening and I drank. Dried up, bring me a little water, bring me a piece of bread. Fled for my life, left my servant. Enough, I cried, arise and eat or the journey will be too much. I arose with strength. Why are you here? I am moved by passion. Still, silent, sound. Thank you, Deb. Uh, and I believe we have five. Um, I actually made that good little drawing of mine. And yeah, it says, um, it says, as the Lord lives, there will be no dew or rain except at my bidding. Thank you. Jen, should I go ahead and uh, bring us to the end? You ready? Great. I'd love to invite everybody now <clears throat> to look at something that is uh, funny, but true. And uh, it's actually where this whole thing started. Um, Julie Volchek and I were looking at this comic strip. Go ahead and click on that link and scroll down to box three. Give me a thumbs up once you see the toad creature in box three. Give me a thumbs up once you're there. Now scroll down. Yeah, thumbs up, good. So in the left side, this is from a much 
this is from a much longer comic, but on the left side, inside the grim cocoon of quarantine, I've metamorphosed into someone else or something else, like a toad, but without the cool amphibian powers. I mean, I have to figure everybody else got weird too. Hello, I eat flies now. So by way of closing, we, we began tonight. <clears throat> you can you can either stare at that comic for the rest of my uh, final piece, or you can join us back on, on the Zoom. Depends on what you're in the, in the mood for. But we began, uh, we began tonight by reflecting on the fact that solitude can be a place of deep sadness and despair and a place of growth and creativity and transformation. And our ancient texts see this like the Garden of Eden. Some see it as the supposed paradise that humanity was ejected from, but I and many others see it as a garden, like a kindergarten, isolated from the harshness of the real world to allow young people to grow it and develop the skills they need in life. So none of this is to suggest that the past year has been for all people at all times like kindergarten. Um, Halavai, I, I wish it was. Some of our families may have been touched by the disease or the difficulties of the year and uh, also, like Elijah, we may have discovered that who we are in isolation is not all fantastic, and yet we may have grown. And many of your poems that we just heard were uh, ambivalent about the year, uh, sometimes ambivalent at best, and certainly taken as a whole. There was regret and disappointment alongside family and comfort and self-discovery. Inside the cocoon, we've been lonely and imprisoned and, hopefully, we've discovered strength and creativity that we didn't even know we had. So I'd like to suggest by way of closing and borrowing from your poems, as well as the Elijah text, that sometimes isolation can feel like a punishment, but it can provide an opportunity for growth. And even when it's growth, a growth opportunity, we may not be, we may not desire it or even be ready for that growth. Like Elijah, he doesn't seem to be ready for the, for the opportunity of growth that God is providing him with. And if we do grow, it may not actually be in the service of reaching some more ideal state, like in that comic you just looked at. Uh, over the course of this comic, if you, if you get a chance to read the whole thing, Emily Flake is a fantastic uh, comic artist, and I didn't know about her before Julie showed her to me. She laments the ways that she's degenerated in isolation. And maybe like her and like me, you're wondering what has the echo chamber, the cell, the private island, the chrysalis, what not only, uh, what has it done for you, but also to you? Are you more able to sit in silence now? Are you more compassionate to the needs of others? Or do you just, do you only care about sourdough bread now? <laughs> do you know how to be in the world? Do you know how to human? Perhaps that's the key to understanding why we bring Elijah into our homes in our most intimate moments, not because he's perfect, not because he's a perfect human, but because he's perfectly human. We're there to teach him, to help him grow, and to model the idea that all of us have come from difficulty and we need each other to deal with it. As that second panel of the comic shows, the saving grace is that even in our isolation, we've all gone through some version of the year that was. We've all changed into a toad. And uh, maybe in a world of toads, we can feel less alone and we can forgive each other's warts, and we can figure out together what comes next. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my partner tonight, uh, Jen, my thought partner, Julie, Gretchen, I wanna give you a shout out. I think you were the first person I ever did a text and artistic experience with that blew my mind, whatever that was like 10 years ago or some crazy number. Uh, those of you I've, Jackie and others that I've learned with. Thank you so much for coming back and learning with me. My colleagues at JCHS, special uh, friends, new friends, old friends. Thank you for being part of this. Um, from, from season to season, I've enjoyed these uh, programs very much as a chance to connect some deep part of myself to the people that make up my school world. And I owe that uh, to Julie for uh, shoving me into doing this and and uh, the opportunity to do it. So Julie, I'll just turn it back to you now. Well, more of what Evan said. Um, thank you all for coming. Tonight was really special and really fun. I got to do art. <laughs> and just be quiet and be still. That is the first time I did that all day. 
Um, so thank you. Thank you all. And thanks for being part of JCHS. Um, we look forward to seeing you with our full toed selves in the flesh, hopefully um, in person at, at some point. But until then, take care of yourselves and we'll see you soon. <laughs>